Dara Hoffman Fox, welcome to Shrink Wrap Radio. Thank you, Dr. Dave. I have looked so forward to this. It's a pleasure. Well, uh, I've been looking forward to it too. And I imagine part of the reason you're looking for, uh, t- forward to it is that you're, you've actually been a Shrink Wrap Radio listener for some time. Do I have that right? Oh, that's absolutely true. Um, I think it was probably three years ago that I first reached out to you and I let you know that I was, I had a sort of this ambition, this dream of being on your show one day, but I wanted to make sure I had written a book before I did so. Um, (laughs) And so in part, um, the completion of my book, part of my motivation uh, really was so that I could uh, actually finally be a guest on your podcast. I knew I had a lot that I wanted to share, but I needed to put it in an organized form so that I could then put it out there. Um, And I was so very excited that you were still interested in having me on your show. Well, I'm so glad you did, you know, uh, that you, uh, I'm really glad to hear that being on the show was one of the motivations that helped get you over the hump of writing a book, because I know that's a big deal. I mean, that's not something that, that comes all that easily, uh, writing books, <laughs> or I would have written a bunch of them. Um, so I've got a lot of questions for you about uh you know, we're going to be talking about your book, which is about uh, transgender issues. And, um, but I think a good place for us to start is with my and presumably my listeners' curiosity about you. <laughs> and so I'm going to be a little bit, uh, uh, hopefully not invasive, but I, I do want to uh, learn more about you and your process of, of gender discovery. And you have said you're okay with that. I actually think it's um, I think it's a really important part of being able to explain this. Um, the more personalized it can become, um, I think the easier it is to understand. So I very much welcome your questions. And I also wanted to mention, um, I know sometimes terminology can be a little difficult knowing mm-hmm. what is it, uh, what are the proper words to use when yep. you're talking about transgender issues. So don't... Um, this is probably a good modeling for us to use for the audience too. Don't worry too much about that as we talk. I can always um, sort of gently let you know if there's a okay. different way to phrase something, but I don't want that to hold you back from freely speaking. Yeah, that's a whole issue that I wanted to bring <laughs> up a little further down the line, but it doesn't hurt to bring it up now. And also, we should mention that you are a therapist, and so uh, no wonder you're understanding and open to being open. <laughs> it's a good exactly. way for a therapist to be. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so, well, why don't you tell us about your process of, of gender discovery? For example, um, from the self-disclosure that you do in the book, I wasn't clear if you started exploring your own gender issues as a result of your work as a gender therapist, or if you became a gender therapist as a result of your own gender questioning. So which came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> <laughs> That's a really great question. Um, and I would say that, uh, honestly, it was, a, it was more of a surprise. So I already was in this line of work. Um, I'm a licensed professional counselor, and I do specialize in working with those who are transgender or questioning their gender. And through that process, as I continued to work with clients and I went to different conferences and attended different workshops, a couple of the workshops started to um, started to bring up some interesting questions for myself that I wasn't expecting. And Mm -hmm. so it's it was pretty much by immersing myself into this line of work um, serendipitously. It definitely, uh, or I should say, synchronistically, as Jung would say, um, it did reveal to myself um, things that I hadn't realized were going on. But once uh, I started to explore them more, it uh, it really did make a lot of sense, as as a lot of things in life do. Once you sort of hear that there's something else going on. Um, you're able to look back and and recognize, oh, there's been hints and clues of this all along. Um, so if you'd like, I can maybe get a little more specific as yeah, to what I'm yeah, talking sure. about. Yeah, and, sure. And also, I can't help but wonder if maybe unconsciously um, <laughs> that's what drove you in this direction of becoming a, a gender therapist. And I suppose that's unanswerable, right? <laughs> Since the unconscious is unconscious. 
But I um, very much am a fan of the unconscious doing <laughs> these sort of things in life. So um, that's a really good point. I actually um, I think that's extremely relevant. And so I would say, not to make it a, too terribly long of a story, but um, in all honesty, this did start um, fairly young. So when I, I grew up uh, as a child uh, during the 1980s, and when I was probably around seven or eight, I can remember um, when it comes to my sexual orientation that I did have um, attraction to girls, but I was also an army brat. I lived in the South. There was nothing that really helped me um, see myself outside of myself in that respect. And so although sexual orientation and uh, gender identity are separate, um, there also are times where it can interplay with one another. So when I was that young of an age, um, I didn't know what to make of my feelings, my uh, same-sex attractions. And so in my head, I would sometimes pretend I was a boy because I thought that was the only thing that made sense. I didn't really think I was a boy, but I thought that's the only way, you know, in my head I can imagine, um, you know, I would imagine that I was, uh, I guess, archetypally um, Han Solo, for instance, oh, as opposed sure. to being Princess Leia. Yeah. <laughs> and so... Um, as uh, my questions about my sexual orientation, I would say they were addressed and answered first, but it wasn't until my uh, mid-20s that I really seriously began to recognize that um, there, that I had this, um, I had repressed it pretty much. Um, I did get married to a man af after college. I had a daughter, um, but nonetheless, it was uh, somewhere around my mid-20s where I started to meet people who were gay and lesbian and bisexual. And I uh, couldn't help but begin to recognize I had sort of this whispering inside of me letting me know there was something that was, it was time to face it. It was time to, uh, as Joseph Campbell says, uh, face my call to action. Yeah. And it took a few years, but I finally... Um, at the age of 30, did end up coming out as gay. I got divorced. Um, and then it took, I guess it would be almost another 10 years before I recognized um, the gender identity piece and how it fits into that. So I wanted to pause a second and see if you had any questions yet before I kind of move into that aspect of it. Oh, how thoughtful. <laughs> a lot of times guests don't do that. <laughs> they just keep going on and on and on. And uh, let's see, I wasn't, uh, uh, I know I went on your blog and I wasn't sure, you know, as I was going through the book and then I discovered you had a blog and I thought, okay, I can get some additional information about the questions that I'm having uh, around, around your story and your background. And so you had, and you actually had a blog post that was about that very set of concerns and it showed a progression of pictures which still wasn't totally transparent to me, but it showed you as as a woman uh, dressed up in various guises along the way, and um, and you mentioned there that you had a wife, so so you've after the divorce, it sounds like you married again. Maybe that's a good place for us to pick up the story. Mm, that's a great place. Um, I did. I. Um, it was uh, 2007 that I met um, my now wife, and we've been together almost 10 years now. Um, I would, I think, this is a good point um, to make: is that I think part of the reason that it's a little confusing, like you said, when you're you're kind of figuring out, okay, where is Dara when it comes to this gender identity stuff? It's not clear to me. Um, I myself am having some difficulty. Ex uh, expressing it um, to the world because it is something that the world isn't quite used to yet, which is non-binary identity. Um, and so binary meaning um, male or female. Yeah. Non-binary meaning um, somewhere in between or mm -hmm. maybe neither mm -hmm. or maybe both. Um, mm -hmm. So knowing that, for instance, when uh, binary is still much more easier to understand, for instance, Caitlyn Jenner. Um, Caitlyn Jenner um, previously identified as male and Bruce Jenner, but now Caitlyn Jenner is female. Even though people are still kind of wrapping their minds a bit around what does it mean to be transgender, that isn't necessarily as difficult to understand. It's like, okay, you're going from male, but you actually feel like a female. It's still binary. It's still something the brain can wrap itself around. Yeah, we tend to think in 
binary ways, you know, unfortunately, and often, you know, it's either this or that, and our brains seem more reluctant to to feel good about the middle, <laughs> mm-hmm. the, the gray areas, mm-hmm. not just in relation to the gender, but many things. Yes, that's a very good point. I And I would say what happened was I uh, began to have clients who identified as non-binary. And interestingly enough, um, I didn't understand it at first. I knew it was something that was just starting to become more recognized and talked about and discussed. And so I really tried to understand it from a logical perspective. Um, What happened was that I then went to, uh, specifically, it was a transgender health conference in Philadelphia about two years ago. And there was a workshop in which it was about um, non-binary identity. So I went to this as a professional. But very early into the workshop, I recognized that as they were talking about it, what they said was, please go around the room and let us know if you are transgender or if you're cisgender. And cisgender means um, cis, the prefix meaning same, that the gender that you were assigned when you were born is the same as the gender you feel you are. So I sat with that question, and um, it was uh, it was definitely a surprising moment for myself where I recognized that I didn't necessarily feel comfortable saying out loud, yes, I am cisgender. I feel aligned with my gender assigned at birth of female. All I knew is that I couldn't get the words out, and I didn't know why. Um, and honestly, it probably took another year and a half for me to recognize, oh, I think I'm one of these non-binary folks. I don't feel like... I want to be addressed as a male or as he or him. I also have discomfort with being addressed as uh, female, Um, not necessarily 100% of the time, but certain really feminine, um, feminine stereotypical type things were feeling more and more uncomfortable to me. And so that's where I'm at right now. And I think the reason it's a little bit uh, challenging for others to understand is because for those of us who are non-binary, we're still trying to figure out um, the lexicon. How do we express how we feel? Um, This is something that we're not even sure. It's just this, oh, it's hard to explain. It's just how I feel. And that can be really challenging to then bridge that gap to educate others about it. I'm still hung up on a minor point. Why cis? How's cis spelled? Why is it cisgender? C-I-S. And what does that stand for? So cis, again, um, Latin prefix for same. So oh, same. I that. Okay. Oh, that's okay. Same gender. So um, earlier I referred to uh, one's assigned gender at birth. So we are assigned our gender at birth. At the same time, we're assigned our biological sex. And it's most often um, attributed to the appearance of one's genitals and at that point, one is usually assigned male or female, or if someone's uh, born with the intersex condition, a combination of both. So therefore, that baby then grows up having already been told, you are male or you are female. Um, And that's what the shift right now, uh, that's where that shift is occurring, where we're recognizing that um, a baby is not able yet to share with the world, actually, this is my gender, Um, even though my genitals say this, my mind and my brain, uh, there's something else going on in here. And so that's where um, a big part of the resistance, I think, is to that shift. Because for one, it is, um, it's a little bit new. It's a little bit different for those who don't experience that feeling to recognize or understand how can that possibly happen. But for those who do go through it, it's um, with absolute certainty that it is happening. Yeah. I mentioned, it seems like it's in the news a lot now. Suddenly there is an awareness, a beginning to be an awareness because of people like uh, like uh, Caitlyn Jenner and uh, the, the movie, was it The Danish Girl? Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. Gets into this. And I didn't watch the Amazon series. What's the name of that one? Oh, Transparent. Transparent, yeah. Mm-hmm. For some reason, I didn't watch that. Uh, maybe I'll be more motivated to watch it uh, <laughs> after this conversation. And just yesterday, my local newspaper, there was a story. Oh, I'm trying to remember it now. Uh, I wanted to save it, and then it got thrown away. But it definitely touched on these uh, mm. gender issues. And, of course, the whole, 
the whole bathroom issue now of how bathrooms are labeled, that's bringing it into, into focus. And I mentioned to somebody yesterday, um, someone closer to my generation, that I was going to be doing this interview today. And, and this person said, oh, I think those people are just, they just want to have attention or something like that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, which I'm sure you've uh, heard things like that too. And I you know, did my best to counter that. Because one of the things that really leapt out to me as I got into your book and particularly from the intro, the foreword that was written by one person, and then there are three essays from uh, transgendered people that you start the book off with. Short, I, is essay the right word or some other word? Oh, I think that works. Um, okay. I call them introductions, but I like actually um, that we would call them essays so that they have the voice, um, uh, their their voices being shared. Yeah, and was that uh, that had a powerful impact on me of these three actual people in their voices sharing in pretty brief format, three or four pages, uh, their experience, their journey, and it really awakened uh, a, a large surge of compassion in me. Mm. Because I think that for much of us who are outside this, this world, um, it seems odd. It's a curiosity. It's kind of interesting, but you know, way off to the side. And uh, what what I got from these was how how lonely it can be, how lonely and painful and isolated, because it is sort of unusual for most people. Mm -hmm. And so these people uh, are isolated and feeling like they have no place. And so. Uh, you know, what you've done with your book and in your work is you're creating a place, which I think is really uh, admirable and really important. Mm. Maybe you would like to get a word in here. <laughs> mm. I, I, uh, I really appreciate how you phrase that um, because I, I really like to hear what is it like for those who don't work with uh, transgender people every day, like yeah. you said, like for yourself and so many people out there, um, it's good for me to know what is it that has helped in terms of educating, helping with compassion and understanding. So I really appreciate your feedback on that. Um, and yes, you are absolutely right. You picked up on it of how isolating um, and lonely and even scary it can be yeah. to uh, be transgender in today's world. Sure. Yeah, I have a gay son, and uh, that probably helps to some, to, to a large degree. And he uh, he was. Uh, you're the second person that I have received uh, an email from that had some instructions at the bottom as to <laughs> the appropriate pronoun to use. And uh, there's another person that I heard from, and immediately I uh, figured out. It wasn't too hard to figure out. Oh, this must be a transgender person. I didn't know that, but they're letting mm. me know. And um, so we have, you know, we're all used to uh, uh, MR, Mr. and uh, Mrs., Mr. and Mrs., MRS, period. And then we had to adjust, <laughs> my generation had to adjust uh, as a result of the women's liberation movement to Ms., MS, period. Mm. And that, that seemed pretty radical. And I think a lot of people still resist that a little bit. They just... You know, they just, older people, probably not younger people, but older people, I think, bristle a little bit at that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now we have, uh, there's a, uh, so as you've pointed out, there will be instructions often, and your own instructions were they or them. But helpfully, you did point out that your name could be used, Dara. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because it exactly. can feel weird to say... Um, uh, and their new book is, you know, when it's just you, <laughs> you're the author, singular. You know, uh, that's... So I forgot I could say, oh, Dara's book is. So that's the... Get Good. Around. I appreciate that effort because, um, like I said, it's even challenging for myself. Um, what I usually at this point in my life have let people know is that I am accustomed to female pronouns such as she and her. And so if they're used, um, no big deal. You know, that's what I'm used to. That's what everybody else is used to. So my second, you know, sort of, uh, I guess, 
suggestion is you could also use my name, yep. you know, to sort of balance that out how helpful. Often. Good, good. Um, and using they, them pronouns, I'll, I'll admit for myself, I have tried it before. Um, on Facebook, I do have it set so that it says, um, Dara updated their profile picture. Um, it is still something that I am not accustomed to myself. Um, I wish there was a different um, verbiage to use. And there are some uh, third gender pronouns that are out there that still are so foreign to the mind and to the mouth that it's still difficult to catch on. So um, I can relate and understand why it's difficult for others to start using third gender pronouns because I'm, I know I, for myself, it's even difficult for me to hear it said back to me. So I'm just uh. kind of kind of in a place where, hmm, so she feels weird, he feels weird, they, them feels weird. Well, <laughs> so I'm going to be understanding and compassionate about whatever pronouns. Um, I would say he is my least favorite because I've never um, associated or felt um, like I connected with a male pronoun. Um, but so that's why I let people know, you know, she, her is fine. Um, if I have some people who are very conscious of this and they do use they, them, which I really appreciate. Um, but then I do recognize I still sort of, it's like when you're listening to a record for those of those of us who have had records and it skips all of a sudden, that's that feeling inside that comes up when I hear either she, her, or they, them. So using my name, my I've been very fortunate that my parents have uh, come up with a gender neutral name for me when I was born, even though they didn't know this in 1974. Yeah. Um, so I was able, I feel very comfortable with that being used, but I know you can only use it so many times in a sentence as yeah. well. Now, there also, I, I mentioned uh, MS, Ms. There's a new title, uh, what would you call it, uh, to designate um, instead of Mr., Miss, Ms. Right, I, right. I, MX, period. I have no idea how that's pronounced. Sure. I was hoping you'd ask about that because um, I have been putting that in front of my name almost like as a teaser for people to say, what's that MX in front of your name? So you can pronounce it either mix or mux. Um, I haven't really had to say it out loud very often. I don't necessarily introduce myself as mix. Um, it's more so for, let's say if I go to a conference, I can have my yeah. name tag. Um, but it is, it is um, for those who do not um, feel they want to use a gendered I guess, prefix, such as Mr. or Ms. or Mrs. And so um, it actually was uh, in April uh, included in the Merriam-Webster un Unabridged Dictionary. Really? As, yes. And uh, I was excited to see that because I had sort of toyed around with starting to use it, and that sort of gave me some extra confidence to start using it as well. I like um, the mixed pronunciation because it, it fits the non-binary thing that you're talking about. I'm not either or, I'm a mix. I, I, was, I was thinking about that, actually, um, and how in terms of feeling like a mix, I feel it is a mix for myself of masculine and feminine energy, mm -hmm. um, even though I don't necessarily connect and wouldn't say it's a mix of male and female because I don't connect with the, the gender of male or female, but it's definitely a mix of masculine and feminine energy. So I agree. I, I like that pronunciation of mix for myself personally for that yeah, reason as well. Yeah. Now, there's, there's gender and sexuality, and those are not necessarily the same thing, uh, we have learned. And, and both seem to go on a spectrum or a continuum, uh, you know, with an extreme, the extremes that we recognize on each end. And so we've got all these sort of different interesting varieties of ways that, of being, of lifestyles, of ways that people find themselves. And uh, maybe you can take us through some of the some of the the important uh, waypoints. For example, uh, I saw an abbreviation in the book of uh, I think it was FTM, a female mm. sort of migrating towards male, mm -hmm. and, and the, you know, as describing a kind of spectrum there. Um, so, what's the difference between uh, transgendered and transsexual? Sure. So um, the word transsexual, I, w what I say is that it's falling out of favor um, predominantly because it is, um, it's a bit clinical, it's a bit um, on the medical side, and it's also been used at times um, to negatively 
uh, refer to those who are transitioning. Um, so it's, it's a word that can possibly be loaded negatively. So what I suggest um, to those who work with people who are transgender is to not use the word transsexual unless your client um, or the person you're talking to uses that to describe themselves. There are definitely some people who do use that word and they're very comfortable using that. So more often than not, those who are transsexual are those who are going to be transitioning, meaning um, they're going to be moving away from that gender they were assigned at birth and they're gonna do so using a medical means such as hormone therapy um, and a variety of surgeries. And so if there was a way to sort of specifically define transsexual, those who self-define as transsexual um, sometimes do like to let it be known that they are very specifically going to, this is how serious it is that they're going to medically transition using the methods that I just mentioned. Well, it does seem serious and drastic to go to the surgery and that must take a lot of, uh, I would guess, a lot of soul searching uh, and, and, <laughs> and thought and consideration. Although I guess some people feel really just driven to it. Is that right? The, the degree um, of intensity that somebody feels that their gender, true gender identity is different from the one they were assigned at birth, that's really important um, to gauge, and it's really important when it comes to what steps should they take towards feeling better. And that's one thing that I really encourage not only my clients, but also their therapists to help the client figure out how intense is this pain, the difference between the gender you're, everybody thinks you are and the gender you really are. And it, it can vary. For some people, it's, it's mild enough or moderate enough, let's say for myself, for instance, where I don't need to undergo any medical um, uh, in the medical steps. I don't need to change my name socially. I'm messing around with the pronouns a bit, but, um, for myself, other than that, I'm fine for those, let's say on the other end of the spectrum, the difference between that gender that everybody thinks they are and who they really are is so big that they, their mind and their bodies are, are literally opposites. Um, and therefore, those are the clients who specifically do oftentimes undergo hormone replacement therapy. And um, if, they so, if they feel like that's in, the intensity is high enough to undergo a variety of surgeries, a lot of my clients um, will say if they could just snap their fingers and their bodies, you know, and their chromosomes, everything lined up perfectly, they would do it in a heartbeat. Having to undergo hormone treatment, having to undergo surgery, the hesitancy more so is because it's just a big deal. It is. It's financially a big deal. Go undergoing surgeries, you know, there's recovery and there's risk, there's cost, and that's where the hesitancy comes into place. If it was something where they could push a button and everything changed right away, it almost, it'd be a no brainer. The, the decision would be made instantaneously, but you're right. There's a lot that is involved with having to actually go through those medical procedures. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're a, a gender therapist. That's how you uh, describe yourself. How many other gender therapists are there? Do you know Do you have any sense of I, get, I have two statistical questions. How many trans people are there and how many therapists are there? Um, I do not have um, specifics for that, but let me give you sort of my vague impression. Um, there is an association that I'm a part of called the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. And this is um, an association that has therapists, surgeons, um, psychiatrists, anybody who specifically wants to work with those who are transgender and be able to be a part of this accredited association. Um, it is highly regarded um, in the field as being a, a legitimate um, organization that provides resources. And there's a huge conference that actually they just had it this, um, this past month in Bangkok. Um, it is the, the numbers are, I would say, at least in the hundreds of how many people are part of that organization, um, probably even higher than that if you include the medical uh, professionals as well. And so I know that to call oneself a gender therapist, there's not um, any sort of specific accreditation you have to do to be able to say that. Um, honestly, it's, it's one of those things where when you decide, there's a variety of uh, different 
counseling, um, I would I would say areas of expertise where you can self proclaim yeah. that you are yeah. an expert. Uh, right. This is one of those, and so for someone to say they are a gender therapist, I feel like it's almost more so for the ability for someone to find them. I know that if I call myself a gender therapist, somebody who's transgender is going to type into their search engine, is there a gender therapist in Colorado? Boom, my name will come up. Um, And so even though I do counsel other people who aren't struggling with their gender identity, um, I do make sure that that's a part of what, how I describe myself. So people can definitely find me. The internet has been a great resource for people to be able to locate myself as a gender therapist in Colorado. Um, so there's those who do work with people who are transgender who might not call themselves gender therapists. And then there's those of us who specialize so much in working with those who are transgender that um, we actually use that moniker for ourselves. Does that answer that? Yeah, question? I think it, it definitely does. Now, you mentioned that you had a daughter uh, you have multiple children between you. So uh, uh, did you have more children? She came in with children. You adopted. What's the situation there? Oh, sure. Um, actually, by uh, interesting coincidence, my wife's daughter is only four months younger than my daughter. So it, mm-hmm. by appearance, it almost seems like we have twins. Um, but they are both um, 15 now at this point. So um, we, in our very small version of the Brady Bunch, we blended our her families together in that way. Um, 15 can be a very volatile age. And so, of course, the question comes up, well, what's been the impact of this alternate lifestyle, identity style, et cetera, on them? How have they dealt with it? How are they dealing with it? I would say um, it depends on where, you know, somebody lives. So where we live uh, in Colorado um, I actually, we actually, my daughter lives in um, one town and I live uh, about an hour away. So there's um, a little bit more of a conservative slant. And so there have been times where, let's say my daughter will run into classmates at her school who are um, maybe either challenge her on the fact that she has two moms. But for the most part, um, especially over the last, I would say, two or three years, maybe because gay marriage um, was legalized in the United States, people have kind of dropped it. Um, People find it more interesting than Mm -hmm. anything else at this point. If they find out that my daughter has um, two moms, they're just like, oh, I don't know anybody else who does, you know, and they want to meet me. And it's a little bit of a strange celebrity status because um, the community um, at large um, doesn't have a, a very high gay and lesbian population. When it comes to the gender identity side of it, I feel like, um, you know, in terms of how people see me, people still perceive me fairly female. Um, those who are listening to the podcast, you know, can't necessarily see, but I do have a, a short styled haircut. Um, I have um, some tattoos on my arms. You know, there might be some s- stereotypes where people might assume that I'm a lesbian um, based on my appearance. But um, in large part, people still assume I'm female. And so therefore, there isn't, uh, there isn't anything outwardly noticeable for my kids where they've run into any issues with that. Um, if anything, they're really quite excited about the work that I do. They've really uh, learned a lot about what it means um, to be transgender and how to help uh, people in their lives who are struggling with their gender identity. Well, that sounds great. Um, and and your wife, I assume, is not transgendered, but is basically a lesbian. Is that fair uh, to say? She's not she, there, but so right. I don't know if we can talk about her or not. <laughs> yeah, probably probably not. Um, okay. But in uh, but. Uh, Certainly, we are by appearance, we are a same sex couple. What's interesting is, and again, this is confusing not only for me but for others, is that because I identify as non binary, it's a little strange for me sometimes to say I'm in a same sex relationship because I'm also saying I don't feel like I have a gender of female. So, therefore, how can I be a female in a relationship with a female? So, again, oftentimes it depends on the situation. Um, If it's if there's no reason to take the time to explain all the details, well, actually, I feel non-binary, and my wife is, you know, is a female. So, you know, we're I'm fine with being perceived as gay, being perceived as a lesbian. 
But if you go kind of one layer deeper, because I identify as non-binary and don't necessarily even connect with the word female, uh, it can pose a little bit more of a complication. Yeah, yeah. Uh, did you have a profession before you came, became a counselor? You know, I was... Um, I, I went to graduate school after my divorce when I was 30, so a little bit late in life that I began this path. Um, prior to that, um, I did go to college, and uh, I my bachelor's degree was in communication. Um, mm -hmm. So back in the early 90s, that really was, uh, for the most part, I was interested in maybe broadcast journalism, uh, video editing, that sort of thing. Uh, what's interesting is that I was able to bring all of that awareness and that skill base into what I do now as a counselor, because I do have um, a YouTube channel. Um, I would love to have a podcast one day. All of my interests in communication, I'm able to merge that with my interests as a counselor. Yeah. Um, and so that's really worked out very well. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, let's talk about your book uh, a little bit more explicitly. Uh, why did you write it? You bet. So um, I think this is the million dollar question because um, I do feel like this was a calling that I needed to write this book. Um, what happened was that once I got to the point where I realized that working with transgender clients was becoming my area of expertise because of the number of clients I had um, who were coming to me, I wanted to be able to expand my um, ability to help people beyond just the office. Um, you can help people one-on-one -on -one to a certain extent, but I, I knew there was more people that needed help. So that's why I created um, my blog, and that really helped somewhat to be able to get my information out there. Then from there, I created a Facebook page, um, which is called Conversations with a Gender Therapist. Uh, it actually has almost 13,000 likes at this point, wow. um, which is great because that means there's a lot of people interested. Yeah. And um, also created a YouTube channel. So that definitely helped um, my information, the support, the education that I wanted to get out there make its way across the globe. So therefore, people um, started contacting me through email, through YouTube comments, through Facebook, asking me questions, wanting to know if I could help them with very specific things in their life. And what I recognized was that there was a huge number of people asking me to help them specifically figure out what their gender identity was. And since I could not do that on an individual basis for those outside of my individual clients, um, I recognized that there was a gap of information and I needed to fill it. And therefore, I needed to fill it with this book that I created. Yeah, I think you've uh, you've really staked out <laughs> a lot of uh, important ground, of reaching out to people and providing them with resources and comfort. I read some of the comments that were posted on your YouTube channel, and it seemed like you were really uh, uh, the word I want to use is ministering to those people. Mm. And uh, that you're, you know, doing something very important in terms of providing resource and encouragement and uh, a place where they can feel included. One of the points I picked up on that I thought was really interesting is that we often hear uh, from, say, somebody who's gay or, or maybe is a trans person, uh, I knew as a child that I was in the wrong body you know, or that I was drawn to uh, the uh, the same sex. And uh, you kind of uh, soften that and say, hey, that's not everybody's path. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was uh, an important point because certainly it wasn't your path, right? Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and I assume you're not alone in that, that they're, not everybody just knows from the beginning that they're gay, uh, but that it can be something that emerges later. Yes, that's, um, I think especially, I think there's a difference generationally um, as well. So nowadays, if somebody has wonderings if they're um, gay or lesbian or bisexual, or if they wonder about their gender identity, it's becoming easier to get information sooner and to go on the internet and find out, oh, this is something that exists. Maybe that's me. Um, that's still very new where people are able to um, find out that information so early. Um, for my generation, even though I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle, 
um, with that. I'm 42 years old. You know, I definitely didn't have the internet in my teens or my young adulthood. So I still had to wait until I literally bumped into a person who mentioned um, their sexual orientation, which started to get my my brain thinking. Um, before that, I thought I was alone in how I felt. Nowadays, people can feel um, that uh, validation of their feelings a lot sooner in life. But for those of us who uh, did not have the internet at our fingertips, um, certainly not knowing that something even exists does give you that feeling where you're like, oh, I don't know what this is, so I'm just going to kind of go on with my life and assume it'll go away at some point. Nowadays, more people are able to, you know, their curiosity um, spikes and they go onto the internet very easily and find out, oh, this is something that other people are experiencing. So I think in the future, we're going to see more and more people being able to recognize this at a younger age. But it also explains why there are a lot of people um, present day who can say legitimately, I didn't know this was going on with me because I didn't even know this was a thing. I didn't know this even existed, that other people were um, having these feelings. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's one of the things that I like about your book is it's so uh, non-judgmental, uh, permissive, and inviting. Mm. Uh, so uh, you've you. got it organized into three main sections uh, or stages. And stage one is preparation. Stage two is reflection. Stage three, exploration. So why don't you take us through those three stages and give us some of the high points. Uh, so mm -hmm. Stage one is preparation. What are you getting at there? Sure. Um, as I began to write this book, I realized that it really was falling into um, the structure of the hero's journey. And I... Which you know have, I'm a big fan of, right? <laughs> I do know. That's why I wanted to... I wanted to make sure. I felt like this was a, a really neat connection that we could have. Because um, one of the reasons I discovered your podcast was because um, I'm very much a fan of Carl Jung and just wanted to find anything I could mm -hmm. get my hands on. And so knowing that... Um, so a lot of people might read this book and they might not know how much it's influenced by Carl Jung. But um, for those who are aware of Carl Jung's teachings and Joseph Campbell, you can see it pretty much everywhere through this workbook. I just think it works so well as an analogy um, so people can recognize that this is going to be a journey that is not going to be easy. And setting it up in the three stages helps people be able to mimic that hero's journey so that before they jump right in and dive into figuring all of this out that they need to um, prepare at first like you said that's the first stage and so um, when I talk about preparing um, I uh, for instance I have the reader this is set up like a workbook so there's exercises in it mm -hmm. I have the reader create um, a log line. So that's pretty much like when you hear about a, a movie or a TV show, it's that really brief snippet where you you get captured into the story. It tells you about how here the, the main character is having uh, what they think is a normal life, but then they recognize um, life is not um, as easy as they thought. They have a deeply buried secret that they need to reveal. And if they don't reveal it, this is the bad thing that could happen. And so I, I walk people through that um, process of coming up with their own log line so that they can carry that with them as they go through their journey and recognize why is it that I need to heed my call to action? Why do I need to find out the truth about myself? Um, which then I take you into the next step, which is um, why it can be scary to learn the truth about yourself. You know, you've repressed things inside of you for a long time for a certain reason. And so I explain what repression is and why we do it to protect ourselves. And then um, having people take a look at what are your fears that you think um, are gonna happen? Uh, what do you think might come true if you follow your truth? What are the things you think you're gonna lose in life? Um, and so being able to acknowledge one's fears and then I think it's a really important or else they're going to they're gonna come up and surprise somebody on the journey and it's going to scare them and they're going to go right back um, into repression. So it's not an easy um, stage for sure because you're really delving deep at this point to um, recognize why it is that maybe you haven't followed through with this at first. Okay. And um, stage two is reflection. 
So in the reflection stage, um, a lot of my, especially my adult clients, uh, they do, they are curious about what clues might have been around in their childhood and their adolescent and teenage years. Um, even if they didn't know this is what was going on, there's different exercises in the reflection stage where they can look back and see um, what is it that maybe you had thought about and what is it that maybe you expressed and then you were told that's not okay and then you repressed it. Um, again, it can be a difficult stage to look at because there can be some painful realizations about how much how uh, much you weren't your true self in your younger years, but it's necessary to have to look for more information about that. And so um, the book is also appropriate for young adults. And so in a way, um, you know, these older teenagers can look at this book and recognize in this chapter, oh, wow, I'm actually going through that right now. I recognize that these are um, things that I'm repressing about myself and that I'm struggling with. And so, um, yes, that's the, and talking about puberty is a huge part of the process because puberty is where one's body starts to develop as that assigned gender at birth. And that can be a point where a lot of people who struggle with their gender identity start to recognize, oh my gosh, my body is developing in ways that I do not like. This is the opposite of how my brain feels. Or mm. even if it's not the opposite, it's, you know, this this feels not just the normal weird puberty feelings that a lot of people have. I mean, it flat out feels like, I've heard it described as, as if their body is betraying them. Um, to, to look specifically at how it felt to go through puberty is a huge indicator of that discomfort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the third stage is exploration. So the exploration stage, um, it takes up um, a large part of the workbook because I feel like there, this is where the real meat of it comes in. Once you're prepared and and you have reflected on your past, it's time to then take all of that information and move forward and actually um, go through certain exercises in this book to start um, testing yourself to see what is it that you do that helps you feel better? What is it that uh, you do that makes you feel worse? And it's by continuing to uh, conduct those tests. Um, this would be like socially, especially with um, or when it comes to how you maybe present your gender in terms of your clothing, um, things like that. The more you test that out, the more information you learn about yourself. And I encourage, after every exercise, I tell the reader, please pause and reflect. What did you learn? Um, uh, how do you feel about what you've learned? Because I think it's important for every step of the way that you pause and reflect and figure out, okay, how does this impact me? Where should I go next? What kind of feedback have you gotten from people about the book? I have gotten... Um, I'm really excited about the feedback. I mean, you always can hope for the best. Uh, and I have had people say that this has uh, literally transformed their lives, that the way the book is presented, like you said, I really wanted it to be very gentle in its approach to say, mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about, you know, being black and white. Let's ease into this. Let's use a lot of different words to describe how you feel. People have really enjoyed that approach and it's really opened themselves up to more options than they thought existed. It opens them up to recognizing their own fears and um, even what's called internalized transphobia, which is when somebody has their own almost hatred against themselves for maybe even being transgender. I, I act as if, I try my best as if I'm their guide through this journey and people can really, they've told me they can feel like as if I am with them, yeah. even though it's just in a book form and that was exactly what my goal was. So yeah. can, my, my hope is that it continues to reach and impact people in that way. Yeah. Uh, do you have, a, you must have a sense of how many books are out there at this point. That is how many copies mm -hmm. you've sold. So the book, um, it's only been about two weeks since it's been officially launched. Oh, well, this, and, is, uh, <laughs> this, this is early days. I forgot just how uh, you heard it here, folks, first. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I wanted to be sure you, you had that. Yeah. Uh, so what uh, I've noticed on Amazon, um, the, the, 
copies continue to climb and there's specific categories that I'm excited to see it climb and there is a specific category that is um, transgender and it's underneath uh, gay and lesbian which is a little misleading but it's uh, this morning I checked and it's number 15 in that category um, even just after two weeks so that's pretty exciting yeah um, I'm also selling the book through my own website, um, and that the sales from that have been great for the last couple of weeks. Been you know busily trying to fulfill those orders, just to kind of make it clear to everyone. I actually did self-publish the book, and so in terms of um, the editing process, the laying out, fulfillment of shipping, uh, creating my own publishing company, this is something that um, I did take on. This is a whole other area of expertise that, that you've developed, and now <laughs> you can consult on that. Um, what is your website, by the way, in case somebody wants to go directly to the website to order it? Sure. The website for the book is discoveryourgenderidentity.com. Okay. And uh, the I, my general website, which has my blog, it's kind of a hub for everything that I do, is um, my name, DaraHoffmanFox.com. Okay. Well, is there anything else that, uh, that we haven't covered here that you were hoping to get in? Um, you know, I just want to make sure that those who are listening who um, currently are working as therapists or counselors, if you are interested in learning more about working with those who are questioning their gender identity or who are transgender, um, my plan in the next six months is to develop more resources such as um, webinars and courses to be able to help therapists um, and counselors who want to um, maybe even specialize more so in this or just to be uh, more aware in general in case they do have a client. So um, the best way to be kept updated on any resources I create is um, going to that darahoffmanfox.com website. I do have a newsletter and you can just sign up for the newsletter there um, and I'll be sure to keep you updated on when I do create resources. I think this book, uh, for when I've heard um, from peer reviews from other therapists, they've said that this is absolutely something you can use as a tool with your clients, even if you're not quite sure yourself hmm, like how do I help this person? You could pick up the book and just chapter by chapter, exercise by exercise, work together with that client. So you could learn as you're going along as well. Hey, that's a good point, and I totally agree. Well, Dara Hoffman Fox, I'm so proud to have you as a listener and, uh, and grateful to have you here today as a guest. So thanks for being on Shrink Wrap Radio. Thank you, Dr. David. It's been an absolute pleasure to be here.